Hello and welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe, your host, and we are back with another innovator interview. We're joined by Mark Schoss, who's the author of a new book, Our Livable World, Creating the Clean Earth of Tomorrow. Mark's got a, a great background as a science writer, and he has turned his attention to renewable energy. Mark, welcome to the show. How are you today? Thank you very much for having me. I'm doing great. Thank you. Well, great. Uh, your new book, Our Livable World, is is really, it's a call for action and a statement of hope and a techno-optimist statement of hope that ha- humanity can restore the climate instead of perish because of climate change. I wanted to start off, if you could just tell us, what do you think the game-changing technologies that are out there uh, that you believe are going to emerge and assist in the restoration of our environment? I mean, wow, where do I even start? Um, it was actually because there were just so many new sure. technologies emerging out there to assist in restoring the environment that I decided to write the book in general, mm-hmm. um, which doesn't always sound very you know, intuitive at first when we get talking about having all these new innovations and brand new hopes that go along with them uh, for folks who are used to hearing only the most negative news about climate change rather than you know, some of the, the new opportunities that we'll have to make things right. Uh, but it's been a crucial development that more and more countries and organizations out there have increasingly recognized climate change to be the existential threat that it is, that much more capital has been flowing into new tech solutions, and more and more scientific expertise is being dedicated to solving these problems. So the, you know, the trickle pace of new developments here and there for this, you know, renewable energy tech or, or that one that we've been used to seeing over the years has picked up dramatically as more minds have been dedicated to solving these problems. So in terms of Uh, discussing some of the game-changing technologies that are being developed, we can look at certain front runners for the different specific challenges that we face. So, yeah, so we have a challenge of powering our civilizations cleanly and sustainably, right? So some of the best new upgrades there have been advanced new solar cell tech, making panels cheaper than anybody ever imagined they could be while simultaneously being more powerful, more durable, more efficient, but also able to do fancy new things for you besides just harvesting solar energy for your home that make them more of a a no-brainer grab for new homeowners. But a challenge like, like, uh, like clean energy also involves, you know, a challenge like new battery-esque energy storage systems to store that renewable energy, say, overnight or on days without wind, new techs that don't just involve building giant battery systems to back up our cities, but also yearly consistent upgrades in everything from wind turbine equipment to geothermal heat harvesting systems to ridiculous new biofuel prospects thanks to new advancements in biotechnology and genome editing regarding the crops and algae we were using before. So... In terms of getting into what some of these game-changing technology solutions actually are, let's talk clean energy. Okay. Because, I mean, if we've been digging ourselves deeper and deeper by adding more and more carbon to the atmosphere every year, the first step is is definitely to, to stop digging. So solar energy technology has been improved so dramatically over the years that the IEA uh, recently revealed uh, solar energy to now offer the cheapest electricity in, in history, bar none. And that's thanks only to scientists and engineers toiling away in labs around the world to improve the materials we use in the panels themselves. But how's this for a game-changing new tech upgrade? One American company now offers a line of next-gen solar panels that not only allow homeowners to generate power for their homes off the grid with sunlight, but these panels also gather the moisture in the air around you to generate clean drinking water for your home at the same time. So the amount obviously depends on, you know, access to humidity and sunlight, but adding the extra functionality of a free two, three liters of clean drinking water, you know, per panel per day to your home, you know, the amount of cleanliness of which you can monitor via app anytime you want, adding new functions to solar panels can absolutely help move the concept, you know, of solar panel for your roof from costly investment to no brainer um, for more and more homeowners. Or how about other advanced new solar cell tech that I discuss in the book um, focuses on new indoor solar cells that are able to harvest lower levels of indoor ambient light or floating buoyant, you know, solar pads, Mm -hmm. so-called photovoltaics. These 
are, are essentially solar panels that can, that can now rest atop bodies of water and help engineers avoid demoing huge swaths of land first to make way for a massive new solar farm, or they can help countries with little land to spare to use some of their coastlines instead. Or we also have the invention of new solar thermal cells that bank heat from sunlight to provide home heat or power thermoelectric generators and store it for later. You know, it's interesting. You, you, you made a point a moment ago that uh, annual upgrades are going to be part of this the evolution. And we often hear uh, uh, resistance to the massive amount of money that's going to be involved in, in upgrading to a, a renewable economy. However, if you look backwards, we have spent at least $100 trillion over the last 100 years moving from primarily wood and coal fired to fossil fuel, we're simply in another transition. And rather than looking at the full price tag, we should be looking at the incremental ongoing costs uh, in order to, to reasonably discuss the need for this stuff rather than saying, oh, it's way too expensive. Now, how much do you see society paying if we don't make this kind of investment in the future? <laughs> well, it, it's, it's funny you ask. A new study just came out probably only about a week or so ago um, that estimated that if we were to switch from coal energy everywhere in the world to just use renewable energy right now, we would actually save about $23 billion globally. So, I mean, there are dollar estimates that we can right. make for, you know, the amount of money that we would save up front. But in terms of the amount of money that we would, you know, be able to save we would save from not subsidizing fossil fuel energy for one, but also if, if climate change gets worse and we have to then pay for, mm -hmm. you know, clean up for environmental disasters and things like that, that can put a huge price tag. Um, I mean, say New Orleans, for example, is, is still recovering in some areas from Hurricane Katrina. And that took place like 15 years ago. Right. But, uh, you know, the costs of added displacement of people due to climate disasters could be a huge strain financially on international governing bodies um, in terms of anyone who needs to migrate from a massively flooded area or from a wildfire area or from a drought area or things like that. Um, and we can save after something like that even happens, they can be threat multipliers that could drag, you know, armies around the world into sustained and ugly conflicts. So I, ideally, we could save on not needing to be in that case, or not needing to be in climate refugee space, and not needing to subsidize um, failing fuel strategies. Well, and in fact, I, you know, to your point, that migration would make the world ungovernable for some period of time. For sure. Everything would be falling apart. But, you know, you previously have written about neuroscience. And so obviously you understand how we have a lot of inborn biases and poor habits of mind. And, and ultimately, as Daniel Kahneman pointed out, that really comes down to we try to protect what we have rather than reach for something new. How does that tendency keep humans from having the right conversation about climate change? That is a, a powerful force at work, yes. So, I mean, a variety of cognitive biases contribute towards you know, seeing the world how we want to rather than how it actually is, whether that's seeking out information that confirms our bias or surrounding ourselves only with people or news sources that, you know, we agree with and, and believe in what we believe. Or sometimes it's even something like the learned helplessness of thinking that we're simply too far gone now to right. course correct uh, yeah, we certainly have a group of cognitive biases working against us in committing to the large scale change required. You know, we connect with others in our own tribe and can react emotionally to things we hear uh, rather than rationally to new information. And that can keep us from assessing new, new ideas as honestly as we need to. And that can apply to people on all sides of all debates, obviously. But it's better than, you know, nowadays with, with countries needing to actively fight against things like fake news and misinformation mm -hmm. um, and getting news only from one source. Um, I have the, it gives me hope that these biases can be diminished and more fruitful conversations can take place. Well, th there's another dimension of that. And young people today are doing things like planning not to have children because they feel that uh, climate doomsday is upon us. And right. in a lot of ways, as, as Greta Thunberg has, has repeatedly emphasized, we should stop using a lot of technology. And, and certainly we should use a lot of 
to stop using fossil fuel technology. But that also creates a resistance to the idea of using technology to get out of this. It's more of a let's go back to something sustainable rather than forward to something sustainable. Is that another major barrier potentially for uh, uh, the younger generations being more resistant to the kind of change that you're suggesting? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I personally believe that technology will be a key tool at our disposal. So, I mean, technology got us into this mess for sure, but we're at a point now in terms of having a carbon debt to, to kind of pay back that the more naturalistic solutions uh, empowering our soils to to store more carbon, planting more trees. Obviously, those are massive parts of any solution, you know, portfolio that we want to put forward to address climate change. But technology will also help us get there at a pace that's a little bit faster, I believe, so that we can spare ourselves some of the, you know, climate related disasters in, in the meantime. So, in terms of sucking down some of the CO2 that's in the atmosphere, planting, you know, massive new tree planting campaigns is a big part of that. But we're at a point where we need to have them planted like 50 years ago. So new technology in that space involves using um, new aerial drones that can be remotely piloted or running on autopilot can essentially fly by areas where we want to plant massive numbers of new trees, scan the terrain, create 3D vegetation maps with LIDAR, sync that to satellite data to organize drop zones and shoot germinated seed pods into the ground. And a swarm of these tree planting drones can get to places more quickly, say, that human planters can't get to, like hillsides, right. and do it about 10 times faster and using that kind of equipment, some teams have reported planting thousands to tens of thousands of germinated pods in a day. And one company that I discuss in the UK specifically tells us they're going to plant many billions of trees over the coming decades. And those are the kind of numbers we want to start talking about. That's interesting. So a swarm approach to our problems rather than a, a single point approach. And, 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 you know, we can see in the vaccine campaigns, 150 different companies were working on vaccines. And as a result, we got vaccines for COVID-19 much faster than ever in history. Yes. Now, there are some really controversial things in your suggestion, one of which is the use of nuclear fusion generators. Can you explain why you believe they're safe and clean uh, and good for the environment and going forward? Right. Yeah, so a lot of people seem to picture nuclear fusion as the holy grail of clean energy. So essentially, there, there's there's two kinds of nuclear energy that we talk about, nuclear, nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. So right. nuclear fission reactors are the kind of reactors we often picture when we think about nuclear energy. So that's the style of reactor where Homer Simpson works. The you know nuclear fission involves splitting heavier atoms into lighter ones, transforming and releasing energy in the process. Nuclear fusion, on the other hand, involving, involves fusing atoms together and harvesting the subsequent energy. So fusion is what powers the sun and other stars and unlike fission does not create nuclear waste or materials that terrorists can weaponize or that rogue states can weaponize and a catastrophic failure of the systems won't cause a meltdown like a, a fukushima or a chernobyl situation but the primary challenge with nuclear fusion and trying to get there is that it's a very difficult reaction to create right. um, we find we often spend more energy trying to create the reaction that we get out of it. So, I mean, the process, the, the fusion process requires insane amounts of heat. We're thinking millions of degrees Celsius and the subsequent plasma has to be controlled, but massive new projects are on the way to try and develop these things to get that energy for humanity. So we have one, one international project going on right now that involves scientists and engineers from over two dozen different countries loaning their talent to try and come together to achieve something great for humanity. That's called the ITER project. Um, but we also have some exciting new American and Canadian companies working on frontline efforts to bring this technology online. Um, one of them in America specifically from an MIT spinoff company called Commonwealth Fusion Systems, they just recently published a whole series of academic papers proving that the reactor design will be energy positive positive and they're shooting for 2025 to bring that online so that, that kind of thing is great to hear and, it, and i'm looking forward to seeing it let's talk about another uh, uh technology that you focus on which is tidal energy arrays sure. uh, this is a way for us to generate 
power at night, for one thing, when solar is not available. Tell us, tell us about these tidal arrays and where do you see them fitting into the, uh, the future? Right. Yeah, I, I definitely think tidal energy arrays can be a valuable part of our clean energy portfolio, because as you said, I mean, they're, they, they can provide energy overnight when the sun's not around. So, I mean, for any listeners who don't know what a tidal or river-based energy array is, we're essentially talking about taking the power of moving water and using that mechanical force to push turbines or gears to generate electricity. So we've always been using hydroelectric energy in rivers. But if we take that same style of equipment, put it underwater near coastlines, uh, moving water, perpetually moving water, can generate energy essentially any time of day, 24-7. And unlike the sun or the wind, Earth's tidal movements are, are pretty much never ending. So for, for critics who hate on renewable energy sources that, you know, are intermittent, they don't often mention things like tidal energy or geothermal for 24 seven. But uh, one of the most exciting new companies that I've had my eye on in terms of tidal energy is uh, ocean based perpetual energy in Miami, Florida. So they're building smaller, more modular tidal energy designs that they can add on to over time. You can add to piece by piece and build it out. Um, so not necessarily requiring a huge upfront capital investment. But um, essentially what they look like is they're little torpedo shaped devices kind of, you know, with propellers on the front tethered to the ground and the moving tidal movements spin the, you know, propeller blades. Like so a tight the wind. Yeah, absolutely. If you picture like a, almost like a tiny plane flying underwater, the tidal movements push that turbine, turbine to generate electricity. And it is 24-7, storm-proof, and can be scaled as much as we want. And so the CEO was recently interviewed by a writer with Forbes, and he estimated that in about five years, they'll have roughly five gigawatts, or gigawatts if you prefer, of energy heading to the Palm Beach, Florida area which is a crazy amount. Five gigawatts is about 15 million solar panels. So we're certainly talking about a non-trivial amount of energy. Now, let's turn to how our listeners can start to act at home. Is the local grid already starting to adapt to provide the ability to both generate power in your home and consume power when you need it? And, and how do you think we need to shape uh, housing and zoning policy in order to encourage the integration of the home into the grid? Right. So acting at home and in terms of how listeners themselves can can take their own action, I believe, comes with any way we can empower science to move forward. So, I mean, we can debate these things all we want, but if we want powerful, complex post-industrial civilizations like the one we have now, we need to employ better technology all across the board. So, I mean, for personal decisions, going green is good. But doing that is infinitely easier when the equipment we have is cheaper and better to use. And right. for personal right. decisions, sure, something like eating meats is a personal decision. That's very good in terms of impacting climate change in a very positive way. So, I mean, um, eating meat is hugely impactful on the environment. Bill Gates even described um, if, if, global, if the global meat industry were its own country, it would count third overall in emissions, carbon emissions. So if you were to cut out meat from your diet as a personal decision or eat less of it, uh, obviously that would, be, that would be great for the environment. But, you know, obviously it's amazing. So eating less of it is a very, very difficult choice to make. So rather than asking people to make a very difficult choice in their personal life that I myself would struggle with, I say uh, we give a much needed boost to the processes making our necessary lifestyle changes more doable new technology making that that more possible. So empowering um, something like the development of plant-based alternatives or labs that are creating cultured cells that create um, a, a, essentially the same cut of meat that you would get at, at the store now. If we can empower that kind of science, support politicians who empower science, that'll get, uh, that'll get us there a lot faster. But for the second part of your question, um, in terms of grid empowerment, Right. Individual homeowners can certainly contribute to grid resilience with solar panels. Um, not only can you lower the local grid load by having your own power, you can contribute to regional, localized microgrids, sell off some of your excess energy if you want to, or bank it for your own personal use. Anyone who can generate and bank their own energy is not as reliant on major grid systems, and smarter grid systems will only make localized networks more possible. Uh, you also make another point in your book that uh, meddling in the affairs of other species and 
uh, ecosystems shouldn't be an assumed privilege of humanity. You know, and we're talking about a lot of technology, human solutions to human problems. How do we design a, a future system that will take into account all of the impacts on nature that this technology will have? What kinds of conversations should we be having now, in other words, to widen the aperture uh, uh, about the impacts of our decisions? Right. Yeah. So anything that's going to impact the environment in large scale systemic ways should in involve a lot of crosstalk between um, representatives from different disciplines. So if we can have a lot of crosstalk between, you know, say, engineers who are working on, you know, geoengineering schemes uh -huh. to talk with, to talk with people who understand how that can impact lo local carbon cycles, local hydrological cycles, uh, meteorological cycles, everything in between. Um, any way that we foresee ourselves impacting the natural world in large ways, we should definitely have a widespread consensus on those kinds of things from a variety of fields. Where do you see those kinds of conversations happening that our, our readers should be following? I mean, they, they generally happen at these conferences that we hear uh, that we hear about, like, uh, you know, the COP conferences and things like that. Mm -hmm. If we can listen to, say, the lectures and TED Talks and things like that from field representatives, they generally come from consensus backgrounds where they go to these conferences, talk to other scientists, and then come away with something of a vision that, that already will include some of the things that they've heard from other scientists. So, you know, one scientist doesn't go entirely rogue and propose something crazy that will impact, you know, the carbon cycle here without having, you know, first address some of the shortcomings that might come from that. So using the, uh, in the seventies and eighties during the anti-nuclear movement, we often referred to the uh, bulletin of atomic scientists doomsday clock. And the fact that we were five, three or in, in one very brief case, one minute from midnight. Where, using that as an analogy, do you see Earth on a climate change clock today? How close that's, are we to doomsday? That's, uh, that's a tricky question to answer. Um, I mean, some of our, our worst and our most apocalyptic assessments of climate change uh, need to keep being revised as more new technology and more new science comes online. Right. I mean, because it's, it's difficult to predict when a major new development will come in through one of the world's, you know, elite academic teams or through a venture capital backed entrepreneur that's not sharing their results. It's very hard to predict um, when a, a huge new advancement in clean energy will ramp up or how quickly, because nobody's keeping tabs on literally every lab in the world um, in terms of their progress in solving these challenges. So I'm an optimist in this way because some of the worst assessments that have been proposed out there, the truly apocalyptic ones in which human civilization is, is decimated and we're living right. in right. this wasteland by 2050, these are based on scenarios in which we truly do nothing to stop the problem and nothing new comes along to empower us to solve it. So we make our predictions today based on the technology we have, but the technology is, is consistently being upgraded and making us realize that some of the worst assessments that we've heard are, are maybe a little bit oversighted. Well, and recognizing that, uh, are there any proposed tech, sol tech solutions that you see that are offering a sort of a silver bullet, we'll fix everything solution <laughs> to the problem, that are really a distraction and people should be keeping in mind that it is overpromising? Yeah, absolutely, yes. I mean, we always want to look for a quick, easy, simple solution that could be a silver bullet and, you know, slaying the challenges we face. But you know, sadly, with a challenge as complex as climate change requiring that we solve multiple challenges, we, we, we clearly don't have a silver, silver bullet solution like that. That's why I'm a big fan of how Project Drawdown's executive director, John Foley, uh, phrases it. What we really need here is some silver buckshot, a group of the best options we have, the various challenges we face, that will solve them all as best we can. So, I mean, the, the tech solutions that often strike me as mere distractions are some of the geoengineering initiatives you've potentially heard about in campaigns to directly intervene in Earth's climate on a very short-term, very direct level. So these are things like pumping aerosols into the sky to block out some of the sun or dumping massive amounts of, of iron in the ocean so that you know plankton feed on it and, and bloom out and draw down CO2 in the process as part of the metabolic process. So these are, are th 
things that there are like massive schemes that you might imagine some evil super genius cooking up somewhere rather than the world's elite scientists. So, I mean, when these are proposed in the absence of, of anything else, which they sometimes are, yeah, they, they sound like distractions, right? Yeah, why don't pumping aerosols into the sky to block at the sun and lower the temperatures immediately sounds, you know, sounds okay in principle, but if doing that and doing literally nothing else is, is bad. So that's why I'm skeptical of some of these um, geoengineering tech-based solutions, because they, they sound like a lot of flash and no actual substance in terms of solving the problem. Well, I, you know, I agree about particularly geoengineering. That's that, and for those of you listening, if you recall the kind of dreary world in which uh, Blade Runner takes place, that's actually a representation of what you would be doing if you were geoengineering. <laughs> Mark, this is a great conversation, and I, I hope everybody will take time to read your new book, Our Livable World. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much for taking the time. It was a pleasure. Well, folks, Mark Schoss's new book, Our Livable World, will be out uh, soon from Diversion Books. Uh, we read a copy. It was a, a great uh, use of our time, and we encourage you to do the same. This is Earth 911 Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe, and we'll be back with another interview soon. But in the meantime, folks, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's take care of the planet. Mm-hmm.